Hi, everybody. My name is Laura DeVoe, and um, I'm a member of the Build Your Advisory Board. And I am located in Newton, Massachusetts, which is a suburb of Boston. Um, Build the Era is an education and advocacy organization focused on transportation and infrastructure as it relates to the Department of Transportation. Uh, we are a volunteer organization founded and uh, powered by supporters, volunteers, and staffers from the Pete Buttigieg 2020 presidential campaign, otherwise known as Team Pete, as well as other new to Pete people. Uh, Bill Diara's purpose is to connect citizens from across America to the Department of Transportation by the following points, uh, education and information, uh, uh, making sure the public uh, knows what the DOT does and what it does not do and why that matters, educate and inform the public to the role that the infrastructure, that infrastructure plays in America's quality of life, provide training and guidance on how to engage with local and federal elected officials in matters related to the Department of Transportation initiatives, provide training and guidance on how to advocate for causes using relational organizing as a primary tool so you can get uh, great things passed in your communities, and finally creating measurable effectiveness and change. Our mission is uh, we are committed to making the Department of Transportation's role in American movement understood by citizens and activating them to engage for smart and equitable investments by the Department of Transportation and for better multimodal planning in their communities. Thank you for being here um, and helping to contribute to the attainment of our mission, vision, and values. Uh, we are uh, really thrilled tonight. Uh, it is back to school time. Um, and so we have coach Sam Balto. He lives and teaches physical education in Portland, Oregon, uh, where he won the Weston Award for his child-focused advocacy through Oregon Walks. Previously, uh, Coach Balto taught PE for three years at Ellis Elementary School in Roxbury, Massachusetts, uh, where he started the Safe Routes to School program to support active transportation for students to school. Through advocacy efforts by Coach Balto and the Roxbury community, the Ellis School in 2019 was reported, was, was awarded the Massachusetts Department of Transportation Safe Routes to School Infrastructure Project Funding Program, which is great. And if you know where Roxbury, Massachusetts is, and you know all the intricacies around that school, um, this is a huge accomplishment. Uh, Sam has enjoyed painting traffic gardens around Portland during pandemic and was recently a panelist for the Streets for Kids NACTO GDCI webinar, Rethinking School Streets in the Time of COVID-19. This past year, Coach Balto started a bike bus for Earth Day at his school that became a huge success uh, at his school and online. Um, and in the preparation for this event, I also came to find out that Coach Balto and I have something in common. We both got our master's degrees at Boston University in the School of Education. So Coach Balto, thank you and welcome to Build the Era and ready for back to school. So we are going to turn the uh, screen over to Coach Balto, who has a presentation. Um, I might jump in with some questions or comments. And then once the presentation's over, we will uh, ask some questions that I've prepared. But please, if you have any questions, put them up in the chat. Um, my colleague, Jan Donner, will be watching um, the chat and will make me aware of any, uh, any questions that we don't want to miss. So. Coach Balto, I'm turning it over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for Bill Dare for inviting me to come to this back to school discussion. Um, let's get started. So I'm a physical education teacher, uh, first and foremost, a parent as well. Uh, this is some of my tactical urbanism when I first got involved, where I put Tom Brady's face on a school crosswalk sign to bring attention to unsafe crossings in front of the school. And sort of that sort of led to the infrastructure grant that we got that was just shy of a million dollars uh, a couple of years after that. Um, I'm a big, you know, physical activity is incredibly important to me. And when the pandemic hit, I immediately saw the importance of, you know, 
being outside, being physically distant, but socially connected. And I created a PE class in the street. So five days a week during the pandemic, anybody in the neighborhood or anybody that walked by each got their family square and we had a boom box and we would lead, you know, I'd lead exercises and games where each family was uh, a safe distance away from everybody else. But that was a really, you know, important for myself, for the community to just sort of continue to be active. And it's really a, uh, just sort of brought even more light to issues around space equity, around, you know, using outdoor space and public space to be safe uh, and inclusive for children to get physical activity. Um, I'm also a big fan of tactical urbanism. Uh, one of the projects I was a part of was something called the Red Cup Project, where we put red solo cups out uh, to show how paint doesn't provide enough protection in bike lanes. And this was a international campaign a couple of years ago after a advocate in Washington, DC, Dave Salavash was hit and killed by a person driving. All right, so let's talk for a moment about the state of student transportation. And it's not looking terribly good. Um, the percentage of students walking or biking to school has decreased dramatically over time from 42% in 1969 to only 10% in 2017. And children cycling compared to other countries, the US is at the bottom. Um, and as a physical education teacher, this is really important because we want to get children to be active. And lots of children don't get those 60 minutes of physical activity um, at school. You know, maybe once or twice a week, they have PE and recess that equals 60 minutes, which the CDC recommends is the appropriate amount of time for children to have physical activity. And this is where the Safe Routes to School program really nicely comes in. And as a phys ed teacher in Boston, I saw the value in getting kids physically active through walking and biking to school. You know, the CDC doesn't say it has to be, you know, 60 consecutive minutes. It could be 61 minute intervals of physical activity to add to those 60 minutes. So active transportation is a wonderful way to add those minutes and sort of build them into your schedule. Hold on. Um, so there's this cartoon by Ian Lockwood. It says, there's too much, uh, there's too much traffic for Billy to walk to school, so we drive him. And this is sort of this vicious cycle that we are in that I've seen firsthand as an educator where parents, rightfully so, you know, feel like it's not safe. And so they drive their kid, which then makes it more unsafe for uh, other children to walk. And um, as an educator who lives in the community, of where I've taught, you know, been very fortunate with that. I see the students who aren't, you know, who don't have parents or members of their community who can drive them to school or who don't qualify for the bus. And it's really important to me to sort of center those students in terms of how we create safe ways for children to school and prioritizing those students. Because if we can make their walk or bike to school safe, you're gonna get more families to feel comfortable to not have to drive their children to school and walk. So trying to you know, beat this vicious cycle that we are in. So I'm gonna just talk about eight ways to improve your active transportation for students. Uh, traffic gardens, movement spaces, tactical urbanism, walk walking school bus or bike buses, school streets, thrive zones, create a plaza and then we'll finish with some policy conversation and I'll get into the you know the details of how to start a walking school bus or a bike bus. <clears throat> so Bill Vieira recently had Fanula Quinn on to talk about traffic gardens. She is the godmother of traffic gardens and knows a tremendous amount um, and I've learned all from her. The traffic gardens are miniature street networks uh, that children can use to learn biking skills, learn you know how to navigate roads around others. And what I've really liked about traffic gardens is that they can be built for very cheap. You can use chalk, you can use paint, you can use spray paint. And during the pandemic, a group of teachers from Portland Public Schools 
went to different schools around the district and we painted traffic gardens. So here's five out of the six of them. And each of these costs under $50 in supplies and were done relatively quickly, you know, a couple hours. And here's a nice little video that we made from one of the traffic gardens we put into the school parking lot. This is great because it uh, repeats. We had a, a traffic garden program uh, back in the late spring, early summer. So this accentuates how easy it is to create these programs instead of thinking you have to do something huge and lots of money. This can be something you do with short money and, and uh, community engagement, which is great. Yeah, absolutely. These can be done quickly and cheaply and then, you know, sort of take that as a way to build more support for higher quality, more permanent traffic gardens. Um, and during the pandemic, I tracked all the different traffic gardens that were put in. Um, it was well over 50 around the country. And this has sort of been updated periodically, but it's been amazing to see uh, how traffic gardens have been very popular during the pandemic and since the Create Space for Children to Move, uh, which sort of brings me perfectly into our next uh, idea is creating movement spaces around schools. Uh, you know, being able to reclaim asphalt to create space for children to get physical activity. This is a part of our school parking lot at my old school in Portland. The kids wanted to create a solar system and during the pandemic, uh, I remember being there and one of the students was leaping from all the different stars and just, you know, working on those locomotor skills and just creating this space that they could, you know, move around and get exercise, um, you know, is really important. You think that that is basic, but the more space that we can create that is car free, the more opportunities uh, children will have. This is also the same parking lot. We did a butterfly mural to sort of get families to sort of view the parking lot more than just a place to park your car. Um, and we'll sort of talk about this initiative a little bit more. This is a personal project in our neighborhood. This is a slip lane that hopefully in the next couple of years, I'll work with my students to create a movement space. Uh, this is along one of our greenways in the area for people to sit and maybe play some games and let the children sort of be creative with that. Um, tactical urbanism is an idea of cheap and quick ways to show infrastructure improvement. Um, over to your left is a protected bike lane that was created by a elementary school and a park. And in the tweet, it said it took them 53 minutes to create this protected bike lane. And I think tactical urbanism is this amazing idea that we can get children involved in to be able to create quickly um, to really sort of show the ability they have to create change in their community. And there's this real disconnect where, you know, a family might say, hey, this crossing's unsafe, but from the time that they, you know, maybe report that to the city, to the project being funded and the infrastructure change, if that parent's child was in kindergarten, they might be in high school. And with something like tactical urbanism, the change can be much quicker, which creates trust in the community. It creates, you know, safety and it gets more people involved. So I know somebody on this group really likes traffic circles. So this is a traffic circle that was created uh, in LA DOT. And they've done what their Safe Routes of School program has done an incredible job with um, using tactical urbanism around schools. So now we have walking school buses and bike buses. And uh, I've done them three different times at the three schools I've been at, uh, the Ellis Elementary in Roxbury in the snow, 
Cesar Chavez School in Portland, um, and at my current school, Alameda Elementary, um, is currently doing that right now with the bike bus. So here is a little video about the bike bus. Hey, Bill, for some reason, we're not getting audio. Oh, we're not? No. This might be a Bill question. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I do see that we're not getting the audio, and I do wonder if they're setting. Sam, we is can, your... Yeah, we can just skip it. And we'll uh, we'll go back to it. I'll we can put the links in the. Uh, put There's the an links. option when you share your screen um, to choose to to the audio of your computer. Share sound. There we go. Yeah. Oh geez. I think we had the same uh, challenge when we did the, the actual traffic circle program. And just as a as a shout out, uh, Fionula Quinn is here. I'm just so excited to be here. I already have students here. This is just going to be an amazing day. Bike buses are very similar to walking school buses where it's an active way for children and families to get to school using their feet or on two wheels or however you can walk, roll. Good morning, Coach Gata. Good morning. <laughs> hello, hello. Wee. Right. It's a chance to, you know, bring community together, get physical activity, um, just have fun and engage with your community in a way that uh, is really exciting. And you're gonna see kids just along the route who as we go, they're just gonna hop on the bike bus. This is just amazing to look around, to meet somebody new. All right, give somebody a high five. We're here together in community again. This is so exciting, an active and healthy way for us to get to school. And I think this is the start of something really special here. And you don't go behind Mr. Mr. Goldstein. Mr. Goldstein? Yes, Principal Goldstein's here. Yeah. So this is super cool to be able to out, be out on the bike this morning. Trying to have all these kids be outside, exercising. It's a great way to start the day. It's really cool to be here. And I think that's the idea is building and starting to scaffold students' autonomy and their ability to navigate streets on their own. And it starts with these opportunities with some support from adults so that they can uh, ride to school on their own. And we have some fifth graders right over here that as soon as I started sharing the idea of a bike bus, they organized themselves. And for the past month, uh, they've been biking to school on their own, which is so exciting to see. And I can see the big smiles on their faces every morning when they make it to school. And this is about, you know, clean, active transportation and, you know, children and young adults building those skills to be able to navigate streets on their own. And also this is a call to action to our city leaders to create more safe infrastructure, space that makes it safe for children to walk and roll and ride to their bikes to school and to jobs and to their friends' houses. Ride around. It's great. It's great seeing everyone having fun and laughing and riding together. I love seeing so many bikes. Yeah. I've never seen it so packed here. It's great. It's, we don't see that many other people out regularly, so it was great and it makes it seem like it's really not that hard to do. And if we could take other kids along with us each day, I think it would help one another out. Sometimes we just need a little support and are, you know, worried about doing it on our own. And this is a great opportunity to see that it can be done. And it just takes, you know, inviting a neighbor to ride with you. And it's going to be more fun to have more people with us. And the more people that are walking and rolling to school, the more people that are going to do it and see that that's just the standard culture of our community. And I think that this is going to be a great jumping off point for more of these type of events. There was a comment asking if it was safe. I'd say for um, the bike bus that we do is on our Greenway network. So I think safe is sort of a relative term, but 
for Portland standards, these are the preferred uh, biking streets with speed bumps and there's a diverter to sort of keep some lower traffic counts. So uh, definitely taking, you know, safety into account. I think also sometimes we might, you know, safety is very important, but there are still children who ride or walk to school on these unsafe roads. And I think seeing those students and creating a sort of group makes it safer for them as well. Um, so another thing that I'm very passionate about are called school streets. And school streets are temp temporary closures around schools during arrival and dismissal. Um, these became very popular in London during the pandemic. And I actually uh, flew there for spring break so I uh, worked with Street Films to make a little video about it, which I'm uh, very excited about. As a physical education teacher who has taught for over a decade, in Washington, D.C., Boston, Massachusetts, and Portland, Oregon, I have seen firsthand the chaos of school arrival and dismissal protocol. When I learned about school streets in London, I knew I had to see it for myself. I went to London for spring break and I met with city councilors, city planners, and parent advocates to talk and learn more about school streets. School Streets is a road outside a school with a temporary restriction on motorist traffic at school arrival and dismissal. The restriction applies to school traffic and through traffic. The result is a safer, healthier, and more pleasant environment for everyone. In the past 12 months, 350 school streets have been delivered across London to tackle children's exposure to air pollution and improve their health. The mayor of London's study of school streets found they reduced air pollution by 23%, 18% parents drove less, and 81% of parents supported them. Listen to how lovely it sounds around the school. You can hear children and families engaging with one another. Such a lovely way to start your morning or end the day for your students. School Streets transforms the experience of arrival and dismissal from car-centered to student and family-centered. As an educator, School Streets are an incredible opportunity to create strong, healthy, safe, and connected school communities. All right. Um, let's say, you know, school streets requires you to um, work with your city department of transportation who might not always have the capacity or want to support a school with this. Um, something that we did at our, at my former school in North Portland was we created something called a Thrive Zone, where our school parking lot was one fifth of the school uh, space. And we sort of made a section of it car free during arrival and dismissal time. Um, we sort of created a new map and it's this amazing thing where, and I fully understand how parents get in this mindset where it's, I'm gonna drop my kid off at the closest possible spot because that is the safest spot. That completely makes sense to me, but that doesn't all, you know, it doesn't work and it creates a lot of chaos and it doesn't make it safe for the people or, you know, clean environmentally for the you know community around. And I, I often say like if there was just a quarter mile radius around the school where there's no car movements, parents would happily drop their kids off. And they would walk or bike and there'd be no cars and their kids would be safe. And I think, you know, just by making a little section of your parking lot car free to reduce conflict points like we did uh, is a great way that a school community can come together to sort of make the change if their city, uh, you know, is not there to support them at the time. So this a is what question, it looks like. I'm sorry, coach, a question came up about uh, that I think it's important to cover is about when students bring their bikes to school and yeah. you have so many, do you have a safe place to put the bikes? 
Yeah, um, we have like four or five bike racks sort of outside the school. And those definitely fill up. And our school is fortunate in how it's designed and we sort of have a courtyard area. So it's away from the road and there's like a sort of fenced in area. It's not locked fence, but you know, there's tons of classrooms that can see it. And the kids put all the extra buck bikes there. Um, so it's definitely a important issue. I think that's like a good problem. I would definitely not say like, don't do a bike bus because you're worried, you know, it's like if you filled up all your bike racks, you're doing something right and like right. try to, you know, you'll solve the problem from there. From, her, from the perspective of someone who's had to install bike racks at an educational institution, bike racks are a lot easier to manage than parking spaces. Yes, so, much cheaper. Um, yeah. It's much cheaper and easier to do. And so there's there's ways to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this is just sort of like a before and after of what uh, arrival looked like before the Thrive Zone and after the Thrive Zone. Um, something that's been done a lot in Europe is creating plazas around schools. So just, you know, finding unused space or, you know, underutilized space and creating more space and moving cars farther away, less idling by young lungs, um, which is very important. So here's in Milan, they've been doing this a lot. And I just love these are, you know, cheap, quick, you can adapt. And you can get children involved, you know, get them involved in the designing, what kind of, you know, the artwork, get them involved in the painting, um, all these sort of things. And I think it's really important to, you know, something that I've learned from the pandemic is schools are not just places of learning, they're community hubs. And the more that you can create space where families can linger and, you know, be leisurely around school, the more that we can have strong school communities. And, uh, you know, this is just so much more community oriented than a long line of parents waiting in cars. And then finally policy that we'll talk about a little bit later on. So here's the flyer of the Alameda bike bus, just to sort of help you get an idea of it. And I'm gonna walk you through uh, how I decide the route. And I don't just sort of like throw a dart and just say, oh, this seems like a good place to start. But I really try to be strategic around where families and where students live to sort of cater into it. And I focus on, um, I focus and I look at the bus because in lots of cities, children qualify for the bus if they live more than a mile away. But if Laura and I live on the same block and I live on the 0.9 mile side of the block and Laura lives on the 1.1 mile side of the block, she gets a bus, her mom or dad gets an app to track the bus, there's roaming security, there's you know, a phone number to call, there's all these services that are provided. Mm -hmm. But for my family to support me getting to school, there's like you know, 311 if your city has that to report unsafe crossings or calling 911, meaning there's not much support. And lots of times a bus, you know, is a great option, but walking or biking is, could arguably be a better option. And so I try to look at the bus stops to sort of gear where the routes go, because I know the kids that sort of get on the bus, lots of times the buses are, you know, late or don't come on time in the morning. It's more rushed. You know, we've had a lot of issues with bus driver spots not being filled. Um, so it's just sort of a e easier audience to sort of target. So this is, uh, my school has four buses and these are all the stops you can sort of see. And on the next slide, uh, the, the house with the circle is the school. Um, the next slide, these are all the bus stops that are between a mile and a mile and a quarter from the school. And sort of based on where these stops are, I sort of start thinking about where the bike bus route should be. So I know Clickitat, which is our Greenway Street, is you know our preferred biking route. Um, so that's kind of where we started. Um, we started over at 53rd and then we just did a straight shot down. That was our first bike bus. And there was a huge success and it was really, you know, just so much positive energy around it that we continued and we added a second route. So here there's to the north, Wilshire Park, 
there's these two bus stops over there. There's a lot of families that sort of live in this area. And it sort of creates this space where, you know, we sort of start from two different directions and then we meet at spot B and it's just this beautiful buildup of excitement where there's kids already at spot B, the two routes kind of sort of come and converge and you're just like, oh my gosh, there's so many kids. And then, oh my gosh, there's so many kids. And it's just this really positive moment that we get to spend together before we bike the rest of the way to school. And this is the student map. So where all the families live sort of based on the bike bus. And you can see how many families uh, benefit from the bike bus and how close it is for lots of people. So we'll continue this this year, which is really exciting. Um, and uh, you know, I've thought about sort of going in other directions with it, but I think that this sort of really makes sense for our neighborhood. But if you know there was families that wanted, you know, they could always sort of organize their own little mini bike bus to get to the bigger bike bus. And this is the map that I did for Roxbury, my school in Roxbury in Boston, sort of looking at it the same way, where I looked at the map of um, where kids rode the bus and sort of sort of tailored the walking school bus routes based off of that. And there's four different routes, and we never the most we did at one time was three, but we would try routes, you know, each uh, like walk, winter walk to school day, fall walk to school day, spring walk to school day, we would sort of try different routes. Um, and we sort of like came to three routes that worked really successfully. And sort of this is what's looking, looking at where the students live, you know, inside the black is about a mile radius from the school, inside the orange is a mile and a quarter, and then farther out. And, you know, you're providing a better service, especially in Boston, for the students who live, you know, between a mile and a mile and a quarter. You know, by the time the kid walks home from school, his bus might not have even picked him up. So, you know, I feel like children have a lot more control over what time they have to leave and what time they get to school and get home by walking or biking with the bike bus. So, you know, people sometimes I feel like might get overwhelmed by seeing how many students are participating in our bike bus. And I want everybody to know that this is the first walking school bus I ever did in Boston. And there's 10 students. And I was equally jazzed and excited this day that I am when we had over 140 students participating in the bike bus in Portland. Um, I think that this was a really incredible feat to get these 10 students to come and to do it. And each time that we did the walk, uh, walking school bus, we would get more and more students. So this is the first walking school bus that we did, and we would take a photo in front of the stairs. Uh, we reached out to uh, now Secretary of Labor, Marty Walsh, who was our mayor, to sort of promote and invite him to come doing the walking school bus with us. Um, and this is our last walking school bus I did while I was at the Ellis Elementary. And in the middle, in the orange scarf, is former mayor of Boston, Kim Janey, who was a city councilor who participated with us. Um, and just to see, you know, when you compare this to the experience of the chaos of parents driving, the chaos of the buses, this just makes so much sense and, and is so, I feel like, so much more enjoyable. Yeah, maybe let's stop on this photo and if there's any questions that we want to sort of talk about. Yeah. There's a few questions have come up about getting buy-in from the town or the city. Um, you've got two very different environments that you're highlighting. Yes. Um, you've got the city of Boston, which is a behemoth, and you've got this more uh, kind of community-oriented school that you're at right now. What are your what are some of the commonalities? What are some of the things that you think might have helped? Uh, what are some of the challenges people have to get in their minds if they're going to advocate for this in their own um, town or, or municipality? Yeah, I mean, it's sort of I sort of 
I'm a doer, you know, I see a problem and I try to, you know, find a solution. Um, there's lots of ways and maybe like when we talk about the policy, that's maybe like to talk, you know, how to communicate with other people around it. Um, but if you wanted to start a walking school bus or a bike bus, I would say find a friend, you know, find another family that you're sort of walking with or sort of like crossing paths with, and, you know, sort of just share this idea and sort of see if they would want to walk together. And then I think just communicating it, you know, I used to work on the Obama campaign in 2008 and I am fearless talking to people and I will promote something I care about till no end. Mm -hmm. And I went around with my flyer, you know, the bike bus flyer. And I just will, will go up to any parent and say, hey, you want to join our bike bus? You know, and they're like, oh, well, I kind of heard about it. And then you're just there to sort of answer any questions. I think like as a parent, or this would be very, it's more challenging as a parent to start something like this. And I would never, you know, you would be really dedicated parent to create something as large as sort of the bike bus or walking school bus that I've been fortunate to create. But that's because I'm with the students every single day. You know, I'm a phys ed teacher. I'm like the one that they really love going to. And I can promote this and message it in a very different way than if I was a parent. Um, it would be much more challenging. And that doesn't mean it can't happen. There's lots of parents that do it. Um, I just think just being very persistent and very inclusive are sort of those, you know, really important characteristics. You know, you want to create something that is fun, inviting, creating clear communication so families know how it works and just sort of uh, keep at it. Right. I want to um, highlight, there was a question, I think it was from Jonathan about um, working with the local law enforcement or traffic enforcement. Um, I see in the Boston photographs, there's pictures of Boston police with you, um, or it's, they, they're in uniform, or they're police yeah. officers, or they're another aspect of the, the police department that might be more traffic enforcement. Um, but is that a necessity? Do you think, depending on the environment that it works, um, do we need to be mindful of the relationship that communities have with law enforcement? What's your thoughts on this? Yeah, absolutely. I'd say the reason, boss, personally, I think uh, Boston Police Department has incredible community agents, like community officers. Yeah. And they sort of like their job is to do these types of events and to yeah. sort of come to school and stuff like that. And, community, um, and I'm going to jump in here, and I think you bring up a really good point here, Coach, is that if your local police department has a community policing program, they want things to do that are productive. Yeah. So if you were to come to them with something like this, that is a great partnership. So go ahead. I apologize. Yeah, absolutely. And But that being said, it wasn't something I actively seeked out. It, it happened that one of the teachers at my school was good friends with one of the community agents who, you know, was like invited them. And I wouldn't have otherwise thought of that. I would definitely say like, it's not necessary, but I always thought it was nice. You know, I felt like we had the police commissioner join us one time. Um, I, I thought that, you know, I really enjoyed, I never heard otherwise from families. I think they appreciated it, but you know, being sensitive to it, absolutely. In Portland, we don't have any police that uh, participate with us, and that seems to be fine. Nobody said that they feel like we need it. Um, but I would say, you know, don't add like barriers to you trying to start this. Right. Um, again, you know, if Laura is a third grader and she has to walk to school on her own, like let's make Laura's walk or bike to school safer. You know, right. we don't need to say like, no matter what, Laura's biking by herself. Right. You know, why, we don't need to wait for X, Y, and Z to be checked off for us to support Laura making her walk or bike to school safer. Right. Yeah. The, um, I, I want to be mindful of time, but I want to yeah. 
get to this idea when you and I prepped for the for the conversation, we talked a bit about how these types of programs, either a walking school bus or a bike bus, can actually be uh, financially beneficial for a city or town. Um, yeah. We talk a bit about that because I think as we're trying to advocate for this in our communities, um, you have opportunities to talk about community, belonging, physical fitness, making sure folks are like, you know, you sent me a great article about physical activity, fitness and physical education and its effects on performance and how it helped actually, you know, getting this kind of exercise in in the morning actually helps kids in terms of their grades and their attentiveness in school. Those things are great. But also, when your school committee is looking to save some cash, right. these programs work. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, that's something I've been really focused on is paying attention to policy side of this. When you know, when I taught at Boston Public Schools, one tenth of our school budget, over one hundred twenty-five million dollars, went to school buses, and there's a lot of chaos that comes with uh, the Boston Public School bus system. Mm -hmm. And I am merely just making an argument that, you know, we could provide a different service or create more options to our student transportation policy um, that serve the community better, that, you know, provide opportunities for physical activity, you know, to save money on fossil fuel, to, you know, create more connected communities. Um, and sort of, you know, talking about policy this idea of volunteerism is over. You know, this idea that, you know, oh, walking school buses are great, why don't you volunteer? The service that they provide is so great that it's, it's not equitable or sustainable to rely on people to volunteer to do these sort of programs. And we should fund them because they provide such a great value. Um, we'll sort of, you know, you can look at the other two, I sort of call them truths, but, um, I recently, before Michelle Mayor, Michelle Wu of Boston became mayor, I helped her with her student transportation section of her uh, education policy. And the two that I sort of worked on was creating more options for active transportation and prioritize safe streets around schools. And this is something I've been really proud that I was able to work with her administration on and continue to work with them with, I recently last year worked with the superintendent and some of her staff around um, sort of what rolling out a walking school bus program would look like. You know, just like how there's a whole infrastructure around supporting school buses, there should be a whole infrastructure around walking school buses or bike buses. Um, this is sort of looking at, if you look at in Boston, one, once each student averages the who rides the bus is about three thousand dollars, and at my school, the Ellis, uh, one hundred thirty nine of those students lived between a mile and a mile and a quarter, and I would argue that that is a walkable distance. Um, Eleven of those students receive IEPs, so they, um, you know, they still would receive bus service. But one hundred twenty eight students at three thousand dollars a pop, you know, that's just shy of four hundred thousand dollars. And then if you were to create positions, jobs, you know, community jobs for seniors, for parents, uh, paying $15 an hour, an hour and a half in the morning to lead a walking school bus in the afternoon, uh, you can see this, you know, there's a big cost savings. Uh, you know, three route, four walking school bus routes for the Ellis, three liters per route, that's 102,000. You know, minus, you know, you're talking over $250,000 in cost savings to the school district that could go to school supplies, go to a full time nurse, go to more teachers, supplies like the, the, you know, it's sort of endless what you could do with that amount of money. And again, kids are getting physical activity. They're more connected. They're arriving to school on time. They're not having to wait for the bus in the afternoon that's stuck in traffic and getting home after six o'clock when school gets out at four. You know, these are some of the chaoses that happen on a regular basis with school buses. So I think advocating for policies that fund more options with student transportation, they call it student transportation funds, 
but currently they're school bus funds. The mm -hmm. money goes to school buses and there's not flexibility around those funds for communities to decide how best, you know, it could serve and help them. So this is sort of the graph that, you know, I sort of envision. And I think, you know, I think something that's really interesting is like sort of creating a transportation liaison and active transportation at school that can support with these initiatives. You know, transportation is hyper local and somebody that's there to support families to, you know, walk or bike to school. They could do bike education, pedestrian education, uh, you know, STEM, tactical urbanism projects. There's so many opportunities to sort of create this and be creative around transportation. Um, and I think before we get into some more questions, you know, Portland Public Schools just passed a climate policy, climate crisis policy, and which is really exciting. I think, you know, there's not a lot of school districts that have done that, but they're, you know, their sort of section on student transportation leaves a lot to be desired. You know, they know that transportation is the number one leading cause of greenhouse gas emissions, but sort of saying we promote, you know, families and children walking and biking to school doesn't, uh, you know, I don't think cuts it. I think we need to do more and we need to support those families more. And I think uh, creating more funds to lead walking school bus, bike buses, all these sort of things uh, would do that. And this is a, finally, this is a survey I did with the families at my school. Uh, 39 families responded. And on days that they don't do the bike bus, we don't do the bike bus, it's like 14 or 15 are driven. So, you know, the bike bus, each time we do it, removes of those 40 families that responded, you know, 14 or 15 car trips. Like that's real climate action. And if, you know, you think about it, if this was funded, like we fund student transportation, you would see an even larger amount of car trips reduced from uh, supporting these types of initiatives. So yeah, well, thank everybody. Here's my contact info and uh, I'd love to answer, you know, any and all the questions that you have. So I, I want to thank you, Sam, uh, for all of this. Uh, Coach Balto has really made himself available. It is clear that he is quite passionate about this. And, um, you know, it's definitely one of those pieces in terms of the idea of building uh, such a program is that it needs passion and it needs people who uh, have the expertise and the understanding of what's going on in the background. One of the things I may ask you to do, uh, Coach, is to maybe give us a, a PDF uh, at some point about maybe some of the pieces that you've laid out there about how to build a program. One of the great things uh, that happened uh, when we had our program about, um, uh, about traffic uh, gardens um, and uh, our presenter who, who did, did uh, that program uh, who's here with us today, Fianula Quinn, she gave us a ton of resources so people could really kind of like drill down and understand what she, what you could do. If you had like a one sheet, like things to keep in mind when doing this, and that might be really helpful because while this video is going to be available on our website, having something to maybe take into my, like a worksheet of some kind might be helpful as people kind of work their way through this. Um, yeah, absolutely. Your point um, about having a champion at the school makes a lot of sense. Um, and, you know, having someone who is uh, a teacher or a vice principal or principal or somebody who's going to commit themselves to being the face of this program with the school district, I think is, is invaluable. Can you talk a little bit about what it was like when you brought this to the attention of your, I'm assuming you went to your principal first, but what did that kind of look like? Yeah, um, I guess I, I'm very like hesitant to add more to staff and like admins plate. I think I'm really advocating for like a separate position, just like yeah. how we have uh, community agents at the school or community liaisons or um, 
you know, this would be a separate position at the school to sort of facilitate this. And maybe it's a 0.5 yeah. where they're at two schools. What I have, I mean, for me, active transportation just completely clicks. For, you know, it makes sense as a phys ed teacher. It plays on a lot of my passions of creativity, really desiring like infrastructure to make sense and to be logical. Mm -hmm. um, I ride my bike and I walk to school. Um, when I, you know, interface with my admin, they're so overwhelmed. <laughs> they are, you know, already have all of these issues that I don't really even like have any idea about. And I try to, I've, I've, I've sort of realized if I have parent support and I have money, like grant funds, I can do pretty much whatever I want. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's this thing, it's like, a principal, you know, if I go to a principal and say, hey, I want to lead a walking school bus. So they're like, and there's all these parents who want to do it. And I'm not asking you for money. They're not going to say no, because the parents want to do it. It's positive. It's getting community together. Um, so I think all these sort of projects that I've done, I've figured out like, I never ask for money from them. I ask very little. And I'm very fortunate that my principal in Portland like lives in the neighborhood, rides his bike, and he's participated in like as many of the bike buses as he can because he sees the value. But, you know, lots of principals might not ride bikes or might not it might not be easy for them to participate and they'll participate where they can. But I think trying to put less on their plate. Mm -hmm. is uh it's sort of already doing the legwork of the parents being the ones that are leading the initiative and i'm just sort of there to help empower them uh i've seen lots of success and i think that it's important for people to really drill in on what you just said and how you put it up in the policy piece um about yeah. inequity around volunteerism people don't always get to volunteer because it just it, it times money yeah. and you need to start to pay for it but when you actually look at this and think about transportation isn't only about a bus whether it be electric or gas yeah. but it's not just about a bus one of our past programs was about um, what we called uh, pedestrian dignity or what our presenter called pedestrian dignity. And it was really about, you know, what we were built to do, which is walk. And so having uh, safe environments and all of that uh, makes sense. I am also gonna put a plug in here because one of the things you talked about uh, was that you know you're you're on the streets whether it be you're on the the sidewalks walking or you're on the streets riding your bike these can also be places where people parents the staff person who's hired to run it and the students can go into the community 311 link and they say while we're walking these street lights were out or this thing was a problem and you're actually giving back to the community in a way that's quite positive. And when people were asking about safety, I think one of the biggest things that actually gets safety issues addressed is when there are a certain amount of community notifications that there's a hole in the ground, there's a trip hazard on a sidewalk, there are these things. And if you keep, if you if you are actually reporting it in the 311 program, the, the data will show this is a space that needs help. Um, and so um, that's, uh, that is, I think, a benefit for the town and the city as well, in that these uh, groups are actually helping to contribute. Uh, what do you think about that, Coach? Oh, absolutely. I think, you know, anything we could do to sort of connect and sort of like bring our children into the like political process and sort of teaching them at a young age that they have agency and they have the ability to create change in their community. And I, I mean, I think about this, there's a mother, Missy Vaughn, who used the box. She came up to me once at the Ellis and was like, Coach Balto, like there's dog poop in the field. And I was like, 311 report it. Yeah. And so she did. And then like the next week there was a poop bag dispenser. 
And she came <laughs> running up to me like this was the greatest thing that had ever happened. And like I've had tons of like three one one successes like that. And I was like, oh great. But like for this lady, like she was seen. Her voice was heard. Right. And the you know, when you start that at a younger age, you know, that only creates more engagement and people feeling more valued in their community. Uh, we have time for one more question. Uh, Jan, is there anything I missed that's glaring? Um, I think that we should just share, if we can, um, a lot of the resources point people in the direction of the chat, because we've been trying to put a lot of these resources in the chat. And I also want to thank, thank Panula, who's been live tweeting our entire event on Twitter as we've been Thanks, going Sarah. along, and it's fantastic. So I shared the link to that. Um, if someone's got a question, raise your hand or shout out to uh, Laura. Yep, I'm happy to take it if anyone has anything. All right. Well, I think that's it then. I think we're good. Uh, Coach Balto, I want to tell you your energy is infectious. Thank and, you. you know, I love when I see people who find their way into, um, a, it's not a job, it's a location. It's something that you're called to. And I think you're called to this and your enthusiasm is great. And just the idea that you've used your spring break time to go to England to be able to see uh, what was happening in the streets around schools, um, I think is amazing. Um, something I want to just remind folks of is one of the things that we are really about and uh, are here to help you with is this idea of advocacy in your community. And if you reach out to us at buildthera at gmail.com and say, look, we're trying to do something in my community and I could really use some help trying to figure out how do I kind of position this uh, to be heard. Uh, we know that there are Department of Transportation funds going to, to towns, cities, states. Uh, and it's, it's important for us to be able to speak to local uh, leadership, which is where the money is being allocated. It's where work is actually being done. Um, it's not coming from Washington, D.C. directly. It's coming through your local cities and towns. And so use your voice, uh, speak up use reason and practicality um, because frankly, the idea of creating a space where children get physical activity, build community, find agency, you employ people in your community to run it and you save the community money ultimately that can then go back into the educational product there's nothing about that that seems ridiculous and out of control. That to me is what we should be advocating for and what we should be doing. And so um, I, I'm inspired by you, Coach Balto, and thank I want you. to thank you. And I'm going to give you the last word. Yeah, I just, uh, you know, I the night before the last bike bus of last school year, um, I was like laying in bed and I just turned to my wife. I was just like, I am so so lucky that this is where I've ended up that, you know, 140 over 25% of my students at my school are going to wake up and ride bikes with me to school tomorrow. And I think it just goes, you know, being more connected and, you know, looking out for the vulnerable students in your community and really centering them is kind of how I've ended up here and just sort of looking out and being connected in my neighborhood and sort of having a sense of empathy for those children that might not normally be seen is uh, just so important. And I, I feel just, I love being here. I'm excited and uh, it's gonna be another great school year. So thank you all. Thank you. Now get out there and learn something, everybody. All right, have a good one. And we hope to see you at future events. Thanks everyone. Thank you.